When you think of the leaders in the psychedelic medicines research world, who comes to mind? MindMed, for sure, after all, they've got like 15 plus clinical trials. And keeping with public companies, we would of course have to add to that list the Thai Life Sciences and Compass Pathways. For nonprofits, of course, there is MAPS, which really is the OG of psychedelic research. And when it comes to schools leading the charge, the two most advanced are clearly Johns Hopkins University and the Imperial College of London. Behind these six are a plethora of other institutions scraping at the heels of the leaders trying to join the big boys league. And if you can't make it on your own, well then one of the best ways to propel yourself into the A-list team is to team up with a member that already is in it. For example, Numinous has partnered with MAPS to treat PTSD with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. If they can use MAPS' collective experience to legalize and commercialize this treatment over the coming years, then without a doubt, Numi will be considered a global leader in this field. Now, it seems that Midasin, ticker symbol MyCoff on the OTC markets and MyCo on the Neo Exchange, is taking a page from Numinous' book. Without much fanfare, on August 6, Midasin updated their investors deck and included an extremely important piece of information that their phase two and three clinical trials testing treating nicotine addiction with psilocybin will be conducted by Johns Hopkins University. Specifically, Matthew Johnson, who we've actually mentioned a few times on the show before, will be the lead researcher for these clinical trials. This is an extremely big deal for the company, at least in my own estimation, and it could be a turning point. So in this video, we are going to take a look at this trial that Midasin and Johns Hopkins are teaming up to run, and we're going to give you a little bit of background on both Midasin and Johns Hopkins. Finally, we will discuss the implications of this team up and whether we can firmly include Midasin in the A-team of psychedelic researchers. I'm James from The Psychedelic Investor, and if you enjoy this episode, leave a comment down below on your opinion of Midasin. Before I begin, I'd first like to give a huge shout out and thanks to Reddit user Bridge Psychological for being the person to first see this development and point it out to the Reddit community. This is super important and it almost went completely under the radar, so thank you Bridge Psychological. Looking in Midasin's new investors deck, if we flip to page 8 we can see the slide in question. This page details the progress and future of Midasin's most advanced project using MyCo001 to induce smoking cessation. MyCo001 is near-pure psilocybin extracted from natural fungi. As we can see, if everything goes well with the FDA, they hope to begin Phase 2 trials in January of 2022, or about five months from now. Now, the most important piece of information on this slide, however, is this here, where it says the research will be led by Dr. Matthew Johnson. And for those of you who don't know who Dr. Johnson is, he is a leading voice in psychedelics. At John Hopkins, or Johns Hopkins, excuse me, he is professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, and has been that institution's lead researcher on the potential of psychedelics to be used as medicines. Working with psychedelics since 2004, Johnson has many accomplishments under his belt, including a 2014 study that looked at treating tobacco addiction with psilocybin, a study that we will look at shortly. In 2019, Dr. Johnson was named president of the Psychopharmacology and Substance Abuse Division of the American S Psychological Association, and he is currently the president of the International Society for Research on Psychedelics. In short, Midasin would be hard-pressed to get a more experienced leader in psychedelic therapy to lead their clinical trial. Now, before we move on, I'm going to play you a clip of Dr. Johnson on the Lex Fridman show, and I'll link the full episode in the description below for anybody who wants to check out him further and learn a little bit more about him. What do they say um, in self-report, if you can put general words to it, what is their experience like? What do they say it's like? Because these are many people, like you said, that haven't probably read much about psychedelics or they don't have like with Joe Rogan, um, like language or stories to put on it. So this is very raw self-report of experiences. Is uh, What do they say the experience is like? Yeah, and some more so than others because everyone has been exposed at some level or another, right. but some, some it is pretty superficial as you're, as you're saying. 
Um, one of the hallmarks of psychedelics is just their variability. So I'm more stressed. It's like mm. not the mean, but the standard deviation right. is, so, is yeah. so wide that it's like, it could be like hellish experiences and, and you, you know, um, just absolutely beautiful and loving experiences, everything in between. And, and both of those, like, those could be two minutes apart from each other yeah. and sometimes kind of at the same, at the same time concurrently, this is about your life. There's a whole life review. Oftentimes people have thoughts about their childhood, about their relationships, their, their spouse or partner, um, their children, their parents, their family of origin, their current family. Like, you know, that stuff comes up a lot, including every, like, like the love, just people just like pouring with tears about like, like how much like it hits them so hard how much they love people yeah like in a way that you know for people that like they'd love their family but like it just hits them so hard that like yeah. how important this is yeah. and like the magnitude of that love and like what that means in their life so that's those are some of the most moving experiences to be present for is where people like it hits home like what really matters in their life this is like at some sense the deepest level of the very sense of self seems to be dissolved, minimized, or expanded such that the boundaries of the self go into, and here, I think some of this is just semantics, but whether the self is expanding such that there's no boundary between the self and the rest of the universe, or whether there's no sense of self, again, might be just semantics, but this radical shift or sense of loss of, of sense of self or self boundaries. And that's like the most Typically, when people have that experience, they'll often report that as being the most remarkable thing. And this is what you, you don't typically get with MDMA, these deepest levels of the, the nature of reality itself, the subjectivity and objectivity, just like the 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 seer and the seen become one, and, and, and it's a process. Getting back to the clinical trial at hand. It is not just Johnson who is working on this clinical trial, but Johns Hopkins itself, as we can see here on page 10. Importantly, the school and Midison are not only collaborating on this smoking cessation study as seen by the first bullet point here, but they also have a five-year master collaboration research agreement to look at several novel therapies and compounds for treatment of multitude of disorders. So. Hopefully we will learn a little bit more about what this entails, this five-year master plan entails in the future. Now we don't have too many details on the shape and scope of this trial yet, but if we go back to page eight, we can see that there will be 20 patients per site, though we don't know how many sites there will be yet. Scrolling down to page 11, we see that they have 12 partnered institutions that these sites could be looking at, or located at, excuse me. So we, are looking somewhere between 20 and 240 patients. Now, obviously, the trial won't include all 12 sites, but if it could include, I don't know, maybe at least five giving us 100 patients, I would be very happy. In terms of goals, they will be measuring how many participants remain abstinent from smoking three months, six months, and 12 months after the treatment finishes. Though, we don't yet know how much psilocybin will be given in each session, nor if there will only be one psilocybin session or multiple. To maybe get some insights into this upcoming clinical trial, we can look at the previous study done by Dr. Johnson and Johns Hopkins looking at treating nicotine addiction with psilocybin. Published in 2014, the study had 15 participants who, on average, smoked 19 cigarettes a day for 31 years and who had repeatedly, without success, attempted to quit in the past. Now, this study gave the participants three different doses of psilocybin, starting with a small dose the first time and increasing the levels each time. For each seven to eight hour session, the patients were monitored, and for most of the time, the participants wore eye coverings and listened to music, retreating into their subconsciousness. The study also included weekly therapy sessions and diary keeping. The results of this trial were nothing short of spectacular. Six months after the treatment ended, 80% of participants remained abstinent from nicotine, compared to a typical success rate of less than 30% for most smoking cessation trials. 
This did drop, however, to 67% after one year, but it is still very successful. And it may point to needing potentially yearly or perhaps biannual dosing. But based on the successes of this trial, I would expect Dr. Johnson to follow a similar protocol in this larger phase two and then later phase three trials, only changing aspects that were learned from previous mistakes. Now, it's also important to note that long term, Midison doesn't necessarily want to use Myco001 or pure psilocybin to treat smoking cessation. At the same time as running this trial, Midison is also continuing the development of Myco004, which they call a patch-delivered tryptamine compound. This is a novel psilocybin-inspired compound that they believe will give them more control over the psilocybin experience. For instance, it will allow shorter experiences of around two hours as compared to seven or eight, and a more personalized dosing regime. We've talked about the need to shorten the duration of psychedelic trips, trips ad nauseum on this channel, so I'm not necessarily gonna go into too much detail here, but the gist is that paying for a therapist or a clinic for an entire day for seven or eight hours to watch over you while you're tripping would be very expensive and would essentially price out almost all of society. Midison plans to start phase one safety trials on their Myco004 compound around the same time as their phase two Myco001 trial is set to begin in the first or second quarter of 2022. So it seems here that the plan on Midison's part is step one, prove that psilocybin is an effective treatment for tobacco addiction and step two, create a better version of the drug that is more accessible for the future. So with all of that being said, is Midison now entering the big leagues to be mentioned in the same breath as Mind Med and Atai? And unfortunately here, I still have to say no. While this is undoubtedly great news, Midison still just doesn't have the same scope and scale of clinical trials as the leaders in this field. For example, MindMed has 17, count them, 17 trials at various stages, either completed or ongoing. And once Midison gets these trials up and running, including one using Myco001 to treat PTSD in veterans, they're still only going to have a handful. They also lack the same amount of institutional background and capital as MindMed and Atai, each who have more than $150 million in the bank. Midison, on the other hand, at least by the end of March, only had 11.3 million Canadian. But despite not being on the same level, this trial of Midison's is definitely starting to catch the company up. Remember, we are still in the early innings of psychedelic medicines, and it is way too early to predict winners. This team up with Matthew Johnson and Johns Hopkins is a major power play by Midison, which will hopefully pay dividends. Also remember that this probably won't be a winner-takes-all sector, and we'll likely see many different companies thrive, with some owning particular niches. For example, Midison appears like they may take the lead in treating cigarette addiction, though other companies are further ahead in treating other forms of addiction, particularly opioid use disorder. Now, Midison estimates that the global treatment market for smoking cessation in 2026 will be around 64 billion dollars. As they currently have a market cap of only around 64 million dollars Canadian, there is lots of room for growth here. If their studies do show that their techniques in treating nicotine addiction are step changes above the current methods, then it would not be unreasonable to set a goal of 1% of total global revenues from smoking cessation, or around 640 million dollars in annual revenue. Even discounting their other main project of treating PTSD, this potential alone justifies their current valuation, in my opinion at least, and gives them lots of room for gr growth. Full disclosure, I do not currently own any Midison stock, and the only personal investments in companies in the psychedelic medicine sector that I currently have are Mind Meditai and Compass. I do, however, have a stake in the Horizon Psychedelic Medicines ETF, ticker symbol PSYK, which does hold Midison. Everything I have said up until now notwithstanding, you guys do need to understand that this is still a volatile and speculative company and industry as a whole. Also guys, I am not a financial advisor and nothing in this video is financial advice. I'm just a retail investor like you who sees great potential in the psychedelic medicine space.
If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, and force your girlfriend to watch it. Also, for those of you who stayed until the end, tell me down in the comments who your favorite top three companies in the psychedelic medicines field are. I want to see if you guys rank Midasin in your top three or not. I'm James from The Psychedelic Investor. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did and you want to learn some more, click on one of the videos you see on your screen now. Until next time, guys.